Thank you so much, Kim. Um, it, it really is an honor to be with everybody today for Centering Justice, Indigenous Artists perspective, Perspectives on Native Art in Public Space. And this is our final session, uh, Thinking Big, Visions for the Future of Native Artists in Public Art. Um, I am very honored to be here today uh, with the artists who have participated in our two previous panels. Um, Elizabeth James Perry from Aquina Wampanoag, Bruce Curlis of the Nipmuc Nation, Jenny Oliver of the Massachusetts Tribe of Ponkapog, Robert Peters of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe, Courtney Michelle Leonard of the Shinnecock Indian Nation, T Tani Aton Harjo Growing Thunder from the Kiowa Tribe, Jonathan James Perry, who is a Quinn Wampanoag, and Nia Holly from the Nipmuc Nation. Um, thank you so much again for joining with us today. And um, today we are going to consider um, our visions for the future of Native artists in public art and think about what we would like to see as Native artists in, in moving forward and having more Native artists working in the field of public art. Um, and as we do that, we will consider the questions of what has to change so that Indigenous artists and cultural workers have equal access to public art opportunities. Um, how can we address systemic racism and cultural supremacy in the fields of art and culture, particularly in public art, to create pathways for more Native artists to do their important work in public space? Um, and so this conversation will be um, just hopefully a, a or very organic conversation um, where all of our artists will be able to share their views and, and thoughts on these questions. Um, so um, I think it would be good to start off with introducing yourselves to our audience and to um, talk about some of the work that you do. And um, as you do that, as all, all of the panelists do that, if you could please also say where you are calling in from on the Zoom call um, and the name of the traditional tribal territory that you're calling in from. So I'll go ahead and, and open that up to our panelists. Elizabeth, would you like to start? Okay. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. I had to put on my earphones because my computer, is, for some reason, is really causing a lot of static um, in the sound. Um, so, Waniki Sak, everybody. My name is Elizabeth James Perry. I'm Aquina Wampanoag, and I am joining you from Aponagansett and Akoksit communities here in southeastern Massachusetts in Wampanoag territory, my tribal homelands. Would any other panelists, panelists like to introduce yourself? I can go. My name is Jenny Oliver. I am a tribal member of the Massachusetts Tribe of Punkapog. Uh, I am a movement artist. Um, I'm joining you from the land of my ancestors, uh, the Massachusetts people. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, Erin, for curating this. Um, thank you, Tanika, for hosting us. Um, I am a Black Indigenous um, woman. Uh, my lineage is, includes that of Cabo Verde, which is my mom's side of the family. Um, my pronouns, I don't necessarily prescribe to pronouns as I don't really think that they fit to any side, sort of space. <laughs> um, but I go by she or they. Um, the work that I do, I'm a movement artist, as I said, and so I create a lot of dance works. Um, I consider myself a trauma-informed, culturally responsive kinetic storyteller or dance journalist. Um, and I'm in the, currently in the process of reclaiming um, my narrative, reclaiming the narrative of my ancestors and also merging those two identities of being Black and Native um, and merging those things together and finding uh, space within that. So thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm muted, I think. We can hear you. Oh, uh, I'm Robert Peters. I'm Mashby Wampanoag. Um, and by way of um, uh, Aquina and New Bedford, by way of um, somewhere in the Boston area, where my family originally native from. And I'm broadcasting from what was once the uh, Neponset village. And um, my, if I had to choose pronouns, uh, it would have to be we, uh, us, and ours. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here among you. Welcome. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is uh, Courtney Michelle Leonard. I'm Shinnecock from Long Island, New York, and I am joining you all today from the uh, territory of the Wapatuke Band of Dakota Nation in uh, Northfield, Minnesota. I just accepted a position as assistant uh, professor of art and art history at St. Olaf College. And uh, my work as an independent artist is focused on uh, the path of the whales and its um, ties to our community as Shinnecock people. Shinnecock in our language translates to people of the level land or um, people of the shore. We're out on the east end of Long Island in terms of our territory, never been relocated. And so um, my work uh, is kind of a documentation of our issues tied to mm -hmm. erosion, um, subsistence harvesting, water quality, and I tend to uh, formulate those works and conversations into predominantly installation art within spaces and uh, conversations and bringing awareness and documentation for our people and uh, what we're facing both past, present and future. Thank you for having me here today. Can you hear me? Yes. Cha waniki sak nata suis Jonathan James Perry Natoma Sakunahana. Hello, my name is Jonathan, and I hail from the Aquina community of the Wampanoag Nation located on Martha's Vineyard, an island we refer to as Nal Bay, um, located off of Cape Cod uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, I am currently serving my fifth term as a tribal councilman for my tribal nation. Uh, as well as being a, uh, a singing and dancing performing artist uh, going back quite a few years. I won't date myself, but it's been a few. And um, as well as a uh, visual artist, I work in a lot of different uh, mediums and uh, for quite a few years have been actively involved in carving and shaping traditional vessels called mashun, mashunash uh, for, uh, you know, at least uh, supporting and encouraging the reestablishment of the Eastern maritime trade and traditions on the, on the coastline. Uh, so encouraging tribal nations and my own community and uh, individuals to maintain and uh, to reestablish our uh, dominance on the sea, right? Um, our territories that are considered floating and uh, moving territories over lands that we once walked on when the uh, glaciers were high and the water was low and uh, before Masha uh, reshaped the coastline and uh, formed the islands that we now talk about and live on and uh, subsist on. And so, <laughs> I've been involved in that for quite a while, uh, but yeah, uh, support and am involved in various types of public art and traditional ventures for our people and other Eastern Native people.
I'm sure you can hear me. My name is uh, Bruce Curlis. Um, I also am known by Anaquis or Star. I've, um, I primarily have been um, writing. Uh, I've been writing since I was 17 years old and uh, of most recent really been able to get my head around a story that's been building my whole life um, that I've been wanting to put out there into the world for publishing. Um, it dabbles in woodworking and painting and just about everything else um, just for enjoyment more than anything else, but um, outspoken about too many issues, I think, sometimes. Uh, but I'm very interested in uh, public art and our uh, expression um, that we have in our lack of expression that we see uh, in New England, primarily, um, have lived in other parts of the country where I have seen a whole lot more of uh, indigenous people and the native peoples of areas uh, doing that. Um, I live, um, currently I'm staying across the street from Jonathan. I can wave to him, I know right where he's sitting. So I can almost see the back of his head, actually. But uh, I have to add humor because part of our way of life is about humor, um, even in very serious conversations. Uh, humor is a very important part of uh, our expression and forms of expression uh, to be able to play and have fun at the same time, uh, taking things very, very seriously, uh, such as this topic of our participation in public art. Um, as far as pronouns, I'm kind of torn in between. Um, I, I go by uh, he and him. However, I'm uh, like Jenny, I'm uh, always wonder if it really matters or does it just take up space? as long as we're being respectful to each other. Um, so I also, uh, as, a, as a Nipmuc, I, my family lines come from both Hassanamisit and Chabanagangamog, um, as well as Natick, uh, different communities within our tribal nation. Tani, would, would you like to? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Tani Atonharjo, Growing Thunder. I'm uh, Kiowa, and I'm also Muskogee Creek and Seminole. I'm, um, I'm in Oklahoma right now, so it gets a little tricky with land acknowledgement, but um, we'll go off the Wichita and uh, affiliated tribes, and then also Caddo and Osage, because I'm on the north side of Oklahoma City. Um, but in that acknowledgement also I want to say about the intertribal nations um, who were forcibly removed here to Oklahoma and now we make our homes here in, in this residency. And um, that lends to my work of where I come from I, as I shared previously that I have a long familial um, uh, connection to New England through my mother and my grandfather's work as museum professionals and as artists um, who lent to my experience and my welcoming of many of you um, into your homeland, uh, specifically the Aquinnah um, community. Jonathan and I have known each other since our teen years and many, many years ago. And um, I think that's my bedroom you're sitting in, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> when I come to stay at the house, um, maybe not, but um, so I, I, I do have a great connection there to New England and Boston. Um, I did reside in Connecticut until uh, 2017, where uh, now I'm a, a museum professional. I've moved into museum administration, working with arts and humanities. I'm also an artist. Um, sometimes I say I'm a recovering artist because I, I went and got a job instead of trying to always um, complete my artwork, um, where I do beadwork and quill work um, and work as a seamstress. Um, now just being a parent and devoted to homeschool and working from home during the pandemic. Um, with a lot of work that I do right now as a museum professional, I do work in American art museums. I, my accreditation is in American art. Um, so I am uh, by all means an Americanist when it comes to um, my academic practice, but 
not so much so being stuck, <laughs> I would say, but I've been fortunate enough to work in native and ethnographic collections, uh, contemporary collections and museums, uh, which has bridged uh, my path to contribute to the field of arts for many of you to promote native arts in the contemporary format because I did discover uh, in the work that I was being expected to do was that we have a huge gap um, from 1950 to current we have a lot of issues with um, the misunderstanding of native arts um, where we're only collecting historic works and then we're also um, not collecting the works that are meaningful to our tribal communities or tribal arts uh, by way of process, uh, mediums, and uh, that's really why I am excited to be able to present with you today because it's my task in order to get the art in front of the audiences and it's also my task to follow through and make sure many of you are funded um, by making recommendations or reading for grants and so that's really why I um, am thankful to all of you who made my participation available today. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Nia, are you available to introduce yourself? Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, it's just been a interesting morning. But my name is Mia Holly. I'm NITMA. Um, right now, I'm in Central Massachusetts, in NITMA territory. Um, I would say um, I got uh, I come into this work. Well, I think it's just kind of um, natural. My mom um, is a very creative person, but also a very active person in our community. And as a baby, I've always been um, uh, active in those spaces as well. So I think it's, um, I didn't really know what else to do now that I'm older. It's just a natural thing. Um, and so, yeah, I went to art school. Um, I did a lot in ceramics and sculpture and printmaking there. Um, now I don't do um, as much as I do as that. Sorry. Um, but I do a lot. Of, Sorry, um, I am um, at a loss for words, but um, I, I guess how I think of art um, and making art and playing practice is really based in um, relationships and um, relationships with land um, and people, so human and non-human beings. Um, and just uh, figuring out um, the language between those things that um, aren't English and things like that. Um, I hope I can uh, communicate better in a few minutes uh, once I'm finished uh, transitioning. Um, I apologize. Yeah, thank you. Introducing yourselves and um, just wanted to uh, kind of circle back to the conversations that we've been having in the previous panels about um, you know what what public art means, what public space means in a settler colonial um, society, and um, circling back to the idea or the the practice of cultural appropriation that is um, plaguing our communities, you know, um, as we think of those things as um, issues that we must deal with, some of the issues that we must deal with as artists, as Native artists working in the field of public art or art, the art world in general, 
um, curious about your thoughts on that, um, you know, now that we've had those kind of conversations and also, you know, what potential do you see in more native artists working in public art, in public space, you know, under this, um, under this concept that we're, we're all here together today to discuss, which is that centering justice. So I would just like to open it up uh, for, uh, for you all to share your thoughts on that. Raising my hand. Uh, hopefully I've been unmuted. Um, so hi, it's Elizabeth James Perry. Um, so I work with a variety of medium, including traditional wampum arts. I'm a textile artist, but I'm also an artist who grows their own materials. So the fibers that I spin and the natural dyes I use and things like that. And in, I'm interested in traditional foods and medicines as well. So I do a lot of gardening and work on the land. Um, my art is also informed by I think the level of exposure I had to some of our sacred sites, so earthen shaped um, effigies and stone piles that, that are figures and petroglyph sites, although many have been impacted, uh, as you might imagine, in the built landscape of an urban area like Boston or nearby New Bedford, which is close to where I live here. Um, there still are sites, you know, some sites are just lucky in that they've been overlooked by development and others have been, I think, really carefully safeguarded by people. And we've probably just worked with non-native people in New England for a long time to make them understand that they're important um, and that shouldn't be impacted. And that's why some of those places exist today. So when I think about monuments in some ways, um, although I certainly have had plenty of exposure to sort of more of a Euro-American formal art school, formal illustration, I've got experience in that as well, um, type of approach to artwork. Um, you know, I think in terms of the possibilities of, of sort of an organic art style that would incorporate rather deliberately local materials, local traditional techniques and people um, for our different priorities in creative expression. Um, you know, I guess one of my go-tos right now is just thinking about this experience of um, reckoning with centuries of trauma. You know, I think that that was sort of in, in mind for me um, because of all of the, uh, the 2020 excitement, I guess I would say. I don't know that I would use that term, but um, it was a chance to, to, I think, for us to think about all kinds of impacts on the human beings here, the Native peoples in this area but also on the lands and the waters and the beings that live and call this, this their homeland as well. Um, you know, I think that for me, artwork that situates those concerns and points to their importance um, resonates with me. Um, I think that, you know, I appreciate use of color uh, for, for my experience working with different landscapes and even the way that our villages and traditional communities are set up, where they're set up, how they're, how they're created, um, and then orientation to water and orientation to the sun and uh, to the eclipses and solstices and orientation to, to different star formations and things um, really resonates and I guess for me, it would be a way for me to ground some of my work in place. Um, so it wouldn't be for me art sort of just conceived at my desk away from wherever it was going to be created, but very, very reactive to the situations there where, you know, I was working with materials, the location, um, the presence, the history, our visions for the future, what I would imagine and would hope would be a continuing relationship of place for our tribal communities and you know, wherever this is. Our tribal reservations are, uh, I have to plug in my computer. Our tribal reservations are a very limited portion of the land here in Southern New England. Um, but our connections to all of this land, that's immense and spanning, you know, we could put a, t a, t a label like thousands of years, but really what, what is that? I mean, that's inadequate to express the amount of time we've been here and the depth of our connections. Um, so I think looking over that time span and then trying to look to the future and think about ways that um, we can teach and share where we could use art as 
a place to gather um, and a place to reflect sometimes, a place of healing, um, pl a place of illumination and joy, you know, a place that celebrates our traditional games and, you know, uh, star stories and um, identity is for people of the first light. Those all seem like really good possibilities to me. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, navigating the complex ways that one proposes art, funds art, and um, gain, gains permits uh, is still really very opaque to me. I think overall, um, I've done temporary art installations, uh, you know, involving paint. I have participated in garden design in my home community. I have participated in my brother's traditional architecture projects, um, including on Boston Commons. And many of us, um, you know, that span the communities have participated in the Boston Fish Weir Project over the years, uh, performative wise or speaking um, and things like that, educating. Uh, but I don't think that the commitment has been there to secure native art that is going to be on permanent display. Um, I would be curious as to how uh, I could incorporate something like wampum, which is really central to our identity here. Um, certain types of wood, maybe cedar, things like that, in a way that protects the material so that it could actually stand the test of time. And I'd be really curious to think about um, the possibility of living exhibits. So, you know, planting a grove of trees in a circle or um, deliberately designing a garden that incorporates certain colors that have a really strong meaning in our tradition um, and creating places where people can, can sit or stand and gather and reflect, creating places that are, you know, maybe little islands of habitat for, for wildlife living in or trying to live <laughs> in an urban urbanized environment um, also seems really good to me to give the chance, the earth a chance to breathe in a few spaces amongst all of that concrete. Um, so those are just some ideas that I thought I'd share. I'd like to jump in. Um, I think that there is a lot of potential for um, Native artists to be creating work, public art in public space. I think that the potential in doing that is really in balancing the scales. I think that there is a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of erasure that has um, been created over all of the hundreds of years and generations of settler colonialism. And I think that especially having, being a person of, you know, dual identities, um, it's very difficult sometimes to navigate those spaces or navigate your identities and find the things that uh, really connect you to your land when those things are not visible for you. Um, I think that there's a, that, and or that allowing native artists to have um, more art on display for the public uh, will definitely be a response to the continued erasure of native and indigenous people. I think that it's a tool for education. Um, and I think that it's from the educational standpoint as me being a professor myself and a person that spends a majority of her time in uh, the academic space, I think that it's important for us to be learning um, not from the interpretation of white settlers that came here and sort of observed us and, and have created their own sort of story of fairy tales and fantasies about what our lives are and who we are and where we've been and how we don't exist anymore. And I think that it's important that having that um, visual for the public, especially in a place like Boston where it's so transient, when there's so many people that are coming from all over the world through these universities and visiting these spaces, there's no identifiers of, of whose land this is, whose it, whose it was previously um, before colonization, and how we've arrived at this moment that we're at today. So I think that there's infinite potential um, for Native artists to have their work be displayed in public settings and have that be a tool for, again, um, responding to this continued erasure and also education for not only you know the tourists and the transient folks here but also for the native people that are sort of blowing in the wind for some of them that that didn't have that grounding um to be able to come up in native culture uh, 
Hello. Um, I think one of the things that we battle against, obviously, I think we've all experienced this, is that you can travel through almost any town or any any place in the country. And for the most part, unless you're in a, na a very strong native community that has you know, is displaying its identity and is is embedded in the architecture and how the community is set up and all that you you tend to see a very stark, rigid, and uh, very colonizer based structure. And I guess there's there's two ways to look at it. One, you can say the erasure is very apparent because as an indigenous person, I can travel through towns that are on my traditional ancestral territory and and really not see an awful lot that reflects anything that has to do with, with our system, values, ancestry, connection to place, et cetera, you know, except for maybe recognizing certain types of uh, trees and wild plants and such that are still there or be driving on on a street that was paved over and straightened that still bears the name of our original pathway or, or village site, right? Um, but the, the flip side of that is that that colonized space is a blank canvas. It's, it really has no meaning. It has no identity. It's want of almost everything. And so we're in a prime place to just claim it. Right, we could Columbus it, <laughs> just discover it and take it over because it is nothing other than just blank space that's could just be chiseled and shaped and molded and made beautiful and identified to uh, you know the ancestors and and the people of the of the various places and what we reflect uh, and what our ancestors who are in the earth and around us and in the trees and in the water reflect and make it visible again. Uh, I think ultimately the one thing we need is uh, support and respect, uh, space created funding and support, uh, advocates to say, yes, it's time to stop erasing or pretending like indigenous people don't exist while we live amongst them, while we use the names for our villages and towns and roads and our foods that we eat and, you know, various things of that nature. It's, it's um, you can't really ignore our people anymore and you can't really pretend that this was always a, a New England or a, a New York or, you know, whatever. And it, it, these are all indigenous places and spaces with indigenous people who have just continued on and at times struggled or fought, but still maintain connections and respect for and some kind of ownership of original space. And so, I mean, it's, it's there. Uh, it's just really ultimately figuring out a way to have some unity and some, some freedom to be able to move so that as we paint the landscape in a different way, um, our children and our grandchildren coming up behind us will start to feel at home in their home. I know that's, that's the biggest struggle that I've had is that almost in every way, there's all this knowledge and there's all this connection and there's these, sto these stories and these traditions and these values and ceremonies. And there's recognition of, like Elizabeth said, uh, preserved sacred spaces and gathering places. I live uh, very close to um, uh, Louis Gwisset, which is a Nipmuc word uh, and refers to the region and refers to a place that we all gathered. It was, you know, kind of commonly held space between Narragansett, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc people, and there were council areas. And, you know, it was so apparent that the English knew that 
annually ceremonies and gatherings occurred so they could actually plan their attacks on us as a people and get three different nations in one space um, and devastate us and you know essentially attack us when they knew we were going to church <laughs> you know um, and so these places still exist and our connections to them still exist our people still exist we just need the population around us to to loosen up the uh, reins a little bit and give people the opportunity to identify in that space and to be able to bring all of those other populations along for the ride because honestly i think everyone is want for uh, something that makes it seem more like a home and more like it has an identity and a reason for being. It's not just a cold, hard place to, to work and scrape together enough to make the next trip to some other place and do the same thing. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Elizabeth and Denny, for sharing your thoughts on this question. Um, would other panelists like to weigh in on this on this question of um, what potential you see in in more Native artists working in public space? Hi, I can pitch in a little bit. Um, the picture behind me um, here is uh, um, a longhouse uh, that we used some NAFA money to construct. And we uh, went to our tribal council and got them to uh, put in some educational money. Um, and we we had uh, 23 uh, Mashby uh, youth and uh, a, f a few from a few other pa tribes. It was uh, at least one Chappaquiddick and um, some input from Herring Pond. And we built this <clears throat> 32 foot longhouse, which is, you know, in, in this picture, it's in a state of being repaired and rebarked. Um, you know, it was built in, I believe, 07. Uh, and the frame is still solid. The, the frame will last more than, than 20, 20 years. And um, since this picture was taken, they, they worked on it some. Um, but it was a way in our own land, you know, to have, have uh, a traditional structure that we could do ceremony in, we could gather in. It's near our ceremonial circle. Um, and it's not used as much as it could be. Uh, but it's something that we, we accomplished, you know, with the help of, uh, of NIFA and with the help of the tribal council. Um, and I think these type of projects would be good in other places too. Um, yesterday I mentioned that we was looking at some land in, uh, in Boston for Native American gathering space and cultural space uh, and <clears throat> educational. Um, and when we, if we're able to ever build structures like this in Boston, uh, one of the partners that I would seek is, you know, the Boston public school system that we could run educational programs from grade school to grad school. And we have the people among us that could run those programs. A lot of those people are right on this call. Um, and I also, uh, Yes, in yesterday's dis, uh, session, um, I identified myself uh, in addition to being a Mashpee Wampanoag as being a Native American resident of the city of Boston. And I think that the Native American residents of Boston uh, have no base, they have no place in the city. I mean, there are, there are, there are there's like NICOB, there's lifelines, but there's not that central thing that brings everybody together, um, which these things ideally should do, but they need help to do that. Um, 
And if there was a distinction, you know, for Native American residents of Boston and that official relationship between uh, the city and the Native people who, who live here, uh, we could accomplish things like this. Uh, we would be more visible. Uh, our culture would be more understood and more respected. Um, so, you know, one of my one of my goals is to uh, work with foundations like NIFA and figure out uh, not just ways they can fund us, but uh, ways to help us build relationships um, and even share some of the relationships that they have, um, and to recognize that you know we are individualized we are fragmented um and uh it's very difficult to come together as native people because we're divided up into so many different ways um and you know the, uh the, there's probably f four or five different legal ca classifications of what an indian is uh and it's very difficult to make headway it's that very difficult sometimes to sit down uh uh, in intertribal sessions and have discussions like this. But we need to open those doors to have that. And for an urban model to have in urban areas, you know, a, a relationship with the native residents of whatever that urban area is and the, the, the city and you know uh, the park programs or what have you have all of those relationships we would be more vis visible and more valued uh, because it would it would give people a place to look to us for um, it, and to be able to sound off with us because a lot of times people will do things you know say oh we need to honor the indians or we need to honor the first people here and they don't know the first thing about how to go about doing that and they don't really know who to even talk to um and that's how we can make it easier for other people to to work with us and recognize you know what we're doing um and uh we would be able to foster uh that uh, uh, state of inclusion, you know, and, and that inclusion, you know, uh, first of all, uh, would be all of us. And I, I kind of jokingly said my, my, my pronoun is we, uh, <laughs> us and ours. <laughs> but uh, for the purpose of doing what we're doing here today, uh, it, it's appropriate. You know, and, and the one that says, what do you mean we, is the one that doesn't belong sitting at the table. Uh, we, we, we're trying to move forward. I think everybody here on this, uh, on this call wants to move forward with what we're doing. We want to do something uh, better. We want to do it more efficiently. We want to uh, do it with, without having to do 10 different things that we're not good at so that you can do the one thing that you are good at. And I think, um, you know, one of the things we should strive for is to create the, sp the support where when an artist gets out and does something, and not just an artist, but any, any Native entrepreneur, you know, that when they get out and, and do something, that they have the support where each person is doing what they do best. And that, you know, um, that those other support areas like you know marketing accounting you know uh uh advertisement these are these are things uh communication you know with with uh foundations and reporting on a grant you know could be for somebody that 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 isn't um good at that that's not their skill it, it could create a great barrier towards being able to get to what they really do right um so I do think it's about building relationships, not just amongst ourselves, but uh, with, with, with the places that we live, with the cities and towns that we live in. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is a good first step, but we, we need to just take more steps like this.
So I just was, um, I was just thinking about like, uh, you know, what is the importance and this question in general. And I, um, I keep going back to notions of acknowledgement. And I think uh, some of the words that were shared by Elizabeth earlier today, in terms of um, how we carry ourselves in our life and um, our responsibility to acknowledge um, where uh, that knowledge comes from and our family and in our extended family. And I think that um, what happens, and we talked about the difficulty of having language and working within these systems, um, it also comes down to like um, separa um, separating like art from other constructs of the environment and science and um, this, the social uh, dynamics of working within public spaces that are all a part of our ways of knowing, but not necessarily segmented into this category or that category. And I was just looking at, um, uh, you know, what's happening in Boston right now, because um, my territory is down in Long Island, but I mentioned yesterday the difficulty of borders um, as being water people is that I all know all of your communities as like my extended cousin communities when we would travel up north and south um, through our waterways to connect and trade. Um, so in looking at, um, you know, any kind of applications of acknowledgement, it doesn't often, um, it's not afforded to our community on the east end of Long Island. Um, usually like New York City is like New York City and that's where you can be a part of public projects. Um, and then New England is kind of like cuts off Long Island. So like you're not a part of that area too. Um, but we're all dealing with the same issues. And just on Monday, um, Boston City Councilor Michelle Wu um, had developed a Green New Deal proposal that's looking at what 2050 is going to be for Boston city limits and your coast rising and the water flood zones and what that's going to be. And so even if you, even if any of us built um, public art under the auspices of how public art is defined right now, it would be underwater with any, any of these regions. And so how do you engage public spaces in acknowledging our truths and our experiences as human beings? And that funding is there, maybe not within the arts, but Boston is definitely feeding into sustainable funding and feeding into new green deals and feeding into all of this language that is not acknowledging our communities and not incorporating our communities. And, um, and I think that also becomes difficult when I can go to a lecture and somebody wants to talk about urban planning and development and ecology where they've gone and studied from some sort of indigenous community and applied it to their um, process, but they're not actually engaging and working in a collaborative manner with those people that actually taught them that knowledge. And, um, and I think that becomes extremely difficult because a couple of components that we've talked about in terms of administration towards these goals is funding. And if you look at how public art is funding funded, it's usually from um, private sectors and those private sectors are sometimes culturally privileged. Um, we don't necessarily come from communities that have immense resources in terms of capitalism, um, but our resources are extracted as a part of capitalistic systems. Um, we just don't have that support. Uh, so then when you see that support being extracted from your communities, then going back to something that's going to offset their carbon um, footprint to make them look publicly engaged and then have that funding going into sustainable projects that don't like incorporate or acknowledge indigenous communities, that's super problematic and that does not go to the component of how we are taught as indigenous people in some ways in a humble way, we usually don't talk about these things, but we also continue our life to be able to acknowledge these systems and acknowledge them collectively. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's really difficult, but you would hope that um, uh, Bruce talked about um, when like Bruce and I had both lived in New Mexico and he had talked about public art being so present in New Mexico. It's present in New Mexico because also um, New Mexico as a state capitalizes off of indigenous communities in terms of their um, culture and their work. Um, and they are benefiting from it, but they are not giving back to those communities to the extent that they should be. Um, but 
it, if we had to weigh things, there's definitely more presence, visual presence of communities within that region where that is not the same for us. So then when people want to say, well, where are the indigenous people? Like, I don't see them. You're not the native I'm looking for. Um, it all lends to that like systematic setup of erasure, that we're not getting it in our school system. We might get it in November. We might get it in a highlighted BIPOC um, kind of donation to a public art project, but it's not consistent. And then, what, then I think the thing is, is that no one is actually acknowledging their personal responsibility in this, but they add the labor to our communities to be able to resolve it when it's convenient for them. So, um, so it's just, it's super layered. And I think that, um, yes, I would love to see more um, public presence throughout. And to go to what um, Jonathan had mentioned is that our language is everywhere in New England, everywhere in New England. Like, and that is something that I've always truly appreciated. It's like, you can go on the LIE and those are all our place names in, a, in our language. Um, and you can do the same thing up the coast. Um, that alone is kind of um, harvesting without acknowledging and without giving strength to the visualization of like our communities. Um, but there's so much that can be done. I just, um, uh, for anyone that's here listening, if you've ever sought out indigenous communities and you're looking for that, it's there. It's just a continual ignoring, like people are just ignoring us, <laughs> like just ignoring us because it's convenient for them. And, um, and then they're kind of like, well, why aren't you doing anything? It's like, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would hope that if we're gonna continue to talk about public engagement, that it also isn't separated because then maybe that could open up more opportunities for um, our communities to work collaboratively and not be succumbed to one budget or, or one space or one support system. Yeah. So I think that that's, Courtney, you're kind of hitting the nail on the head there, you know, as far as the usury um, method in which the sort of colonial or colonizer mindset took so much. I mean, so many gifts that our people freely shared within, ex I guess from a cultural standpoint, uh, expected reciprocal relationships, right? Like you know, you don't give gifts and then not expect something in return. Like, <laughs> it, it's just automatic. Like here's, here's some of the finest things that I have to offer and all right, what, what are you bringing to the table now? And our people just continuously waited or were expecting that response. Right. And so, you know, whether you're talking about medicines or you're talking about corn and other food items or, or even, um, even sort of uh, concepts of cleanliness and, and, and so on and so forth. Like in, the, in this country, they were taken from our people and our community and our teachings and no acknowledgement, no, no uh, gifts were given back. And it's, the system that was built and it doesn't know how to be any different. Like everyone who comes here, starts to live here, just falls right into participating in that same system because it was built off of using and abusing. And it has only made people harder and more disconnected because it was never resolved. There, there never was a waking up point where it was all renegotiated where there was a rethinking and a complete shift in cultural values as a general society. And so generation after generation of people fall in the same footsteps and the same practices and, and newcomers fit in because they want to fit into where they now live. And indigenous people are just still in the corner saying, hey, uh, by the way, <laughs> you're still living off of our teachings, our food, our medicines, our generosity on our land and still 
disregarding our sacred spaces and removing the bones of our ancestors to do so. And I think that's kind of where that sort of general education and, and really simple method of giving respect and acknowledgements has to be uh, achieved with the general public. And it's, it's hard to write it once there's so many generations of people taught not to, you know, when, when everyone has been trained from childhood to ignore and to displace or, or to disregard a whole, you know, a whole nation of people and all that they've given and ignore the fact that they're living and breathing in front of you. They're taught to put these blinders on as children that they never learn how to remove. And so that's, that's really ultimately the, the issue of it, right? If our people were somehow marketable suddenly, you would see a complete change because there would be a lot of businesses saying, oh, we can market this. And there would be a lot of entrepreneurs who said, how can we use the folks? But I don't know that it would be any better because you would have the duplicating of places like Santa Fe where it's very usury in a different way. Yes, there are artists who are making some money um, and there is an, a more artistic outward expression of place because of it, but the people are still having a hard time and they're still not being regarded as equals and respected. And they're not in control of how their story is, is taught. And, you know, so it's, I've, I've seen it all over and you see it in, in instances all over the world. It's varying ways that the, the whole marketing system works with indigenous people or doesn't work for indigenous people. And it's, sort of pre-figured and it's really hard to change. And I think that's where you educate the general population to say, don't fall into this, ignore it and change it and have respect. Then we can all figure out at that point how to move forward. But it's that general, really basic level of respect that has to be achieved before the door even opens up for almost any other option. So I, I want to piggyback on, on Jonathan just a little bit um, because I, I agree with him somewhat and I disagree with him a little bit. And I think that's where the beauty of dialogue comes in and really sort of thinking about vision. You know, one of the things you said was the, the construct of a reciprocal relationship when there's gifting. And I was always taught you give freely. Um, you're not expecting something in return when you give freely. And that those were part of our original instructions. Of course, there was a, the caveat was that, is that there was a cultural understanding that when I came to your community, I would bring gifts. Um, when you came to my community, you would bring gifts. I mean, these are, these are the constructs that we understood on this continent, in this land, in this area. We, we had a sharing reciprocal relationship. So we bring in this Eurocentric idea that we call col uh, colonialism. It's a Eurocentric idea of it's there for your, it's there for your taking. It's like, we're going to send you across the ocean. Some of you will make it, some of you won't. You'll be sick. You come here. Now, one of the interpretations that is interesting with that is that, well, our concepts of war is you don't bring, we never brought our women to war unless they were the warriors who stood with us. When you see new people or visitors coming with women and children, well, we don't bring them to war. So they can't be here to have a battle with us. They must be lost. Well, let's find out what they're doing here. Oh, they're hungry, let's feed them. Oh, we teach them this. We teach them how to uh, fish and hunt and, and gather um, so that they, the reciprocal relationship is that they will take care of themselves and we don't have to take care of them anymore. In, in some ways, when you think about it that way, you know, because we have become part of, part of, part of the, the fundamental issues that we have, and I think it was um, um, uh, Howard Zinn started getting into this a little bit, um, with an enemy's language, right? We, we start to use the language and the ways 
to fight a battle against the people who designed the battle, as opposed to, no, we're going to hold on to our traditions and think about it the same way. And when we're successful, even when you look at tribes that are successful, what they did is they used the enemy's language against them, as opposed to trying to hold on to our um, cultural identity. But you do it specifically in an arena. You do it specifically in lobbying. You do it specifically in funding. You do it specifically in education. You do it specifically, you, you find their loopholes and you use their loopholes the same way they would use their loopholes. And then we begin to see some progress moving forward. When we keep and hold on to what we think are our traditional values, because they're important, right? They're, they're, there's nothing more important than them in our lives. However, if we're having interface with a different cultural idea that does not understand ours, nor do we understand theirs, we create conflict. Or what happens is one of you gets better than the other and starts to use that against each other. So that you can say, oh yeah, that's what we're gonna do. You know, as long as the grass grows, you can live there. Um, and then they dwindle it down by burning all the grass and putting in highways, and well, the grass isn't growing there, so it was there yours till the grass can grow, or the rivers flow, so we'll dam them. So you use the ideas of what you expect against your own enemy. So when I, one of the one of the things that I think about um, in context for this for this of what's the big idea is that where where is it? You know, where is it? I could, I could go to Grafton probably tomorrow with a great idea to put on the common a piece of indigenous art from the tribal people of Nipmuc in Grafton as a gift to the town, knowing darn well it's really promoting myself and us in, in our tribe. First question that they're going to say is, well, who's paying for it? Right, because that's how they think. And if I said I'm paying for it, they would be, okay, what's it look like? Because, you know, they, they continue to take a carrot and they put it in front of you and they just move it forward. This is a great idea. We love it. It's great. Well, who's going to pay for it? First pull of the carrot. Okay, I am. Carrot comes back to me. What's it look like? It looks like this. Well, you know, we'd have to have the board of zoning. We have to, you know, they, they start to try to continue to dangle it a little bit further away from you each time. Because what we haven't figured out how to do is we haven't figured out how for us to take the carrot and say, here's the carrot. Oh, you want us to do that? Well, we're going to pull this back if not, because we don't control what's important in that cultural context. How does it benefit me? Right? Eurocentric idea of how does it benefit me? Colonial idea, how does it benefit me? I came here because it benefited me. That mentality has continued to remain. That mentality continues today. Because we haven't really sat down and figured out, because I have ideas, and Aaron has ideas, and Jenny has ideas, and you, Jonathan, have ideas. We haven't created our common language so that when we're talking about these ideas, that we're all talking about exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. Because now there's not a hole in our armor. And then we have to think about our individuality, right? Are we committed or are you committed to, when we create that language, to not take advantage of it for your self-benefit? That's what they do. That's what they did with the civil rights. That's what they did with the American Indian movement. When native people started getting all, making all the noise, when, um, when people were, were talking about all the things during civil rights, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create social programming. We throw money at it and people forget about it. We're now seeing the effects of all of that snowballing right now because the racism never went away when they did that. It never went away. It's still there even more prevalent than it ever was before. So now we're dealing with the outcome of not, of not having that common language and saying, you know what, yeah, this is great. This is wonderful. This is awesome. 
And I think anyone who's worked in social programming at any point in time run into what I, what I prefer to call poverty pimps. They've made immense amounts of money on the backs of trying to fix poverty. That executive director who's make, or the founder who's making 150 to $400,000 a year doesn't care if it actually really works for the guy who's making $20,000 a year on the front lines. Because they, they know the language. It's exclusive, it's a club. Where they have a common language to know how that works and know how to continue to keep that funding flowing and knowing how to say, this is how we'll keep people quiet. Well, it's not working anymore. And, and believe me, I, I believe, I truly believe that they're trying to figure out social programming right now in Congress that they can throw out to these communities to get them to calm down. How do we get them to calm down? We need them to calm down. So we'll throw money at it because they believe that's it. And there will be someone who's like, well, I can make some money off of this. So I'm gonna take that money. I'm gonna create a great program because I, this is what I've always wanted to do. But what's really truly the impact? The true impact is for a handful of people, a cluster of people, a small part of town, doesn't solve the problem. And it's because the communities are just now starting to stick together saying, no, it's not enough. No, it's not enough. Well, the same fits in every realm of what we do in this country as human beings. So if we're sitting here, and, and this was a, a conversation that I think I'd like to have at some point, if we're sitting here saying, what's our common language? What's our commonality? And what do we agree on as a public place? Because someone might say, well, you know what? I'd love to see something. A public place is, where are they putting all these statues and where is this art gonna be most seen? Where is it gonna be most seen? That could be for art, a public place, because you know, they choose very well where certain things are going to be. You know, the Holocaust wall was put very specifically where it was so that people would go see it, but also support the local businesses around it. Art that's put on the common, you know, they have pathways, different colored pathways and lines that lead you to these places. Very specifically to take you by businesses where people can profit. So where's our art go, or a public installation go, that actually does the same thing? And then how do we take it one step further and create economic impact for these same native communities? By what are, the, what are we creating for ourselves around that? What, what are the stores that could be around that that we could have? What are the vendors around that that we could have? So, so then we start to see the shift and change because now we have a commonality and understanding that creates a common language that guess what? This is your language we're using against you. That's all we're doing. And now we get a place maybe at the table, but at least a lot closer to the table than we are now. Maybe we get a seat that's right behind the person sitting at the table or the ear of somebody that's the ally that's sitting at the table that can help this to continue to grow because you have to keep it moving. It has to always be, it's, a, it's always a moving target. But then there's the other side of it was, is when we think about funding. And I, I brought this up yesterday a little bit when we think about our, the funding. You know, we chase funding. This piece of funding shows up on whatever it is and we say, oh, let's design something to fit the funding. We never go to the funders and say, this is what we wanna do, fund it. How can you fund this? Design the RFP to fit what we're trying to do versus us trying to fit what the RFP says they wanna see happen. Because when we can start to do that, we actually control what our art, what our public spaces are and not before. So one of the things that I'd like to see as we're going forward is, is, is the next conversation about what is that common language? What is that common understanding when we say public space? What is it when we say access to art in public space? Is it just this or is it just this or is it all of this? I believe it's all of it. And I think we, we, I think we have to have um, 
enough controls to say, yeah, we accept all of it. If movement is part of it, that's what it's part of. If, if the spoken word is part of it, that's what's part of it. If the written word's part of it, that's what's part of it. If it's huge pieces of steel going up, that's what's part of it. And then Courtney mentioned something yesterday in our session about mentorship, because we're never gonna get there unless we know how to do the whole process. And we have showing us how to do that process. The, the other thing too, uh, um, Bruce, when you were talking about um, uh, working within the languages, and I don't know if the city of Boston has this, but um, developing council um, an indigenous council that, I mean, because if we're looking into RFQs and funding, those are usually regulated by public funds or, right. um, in re, or state um, or federal funds, depending on where the funding um, is coming from. In that regard, to be there in the beginning of the conversation and developing those RFQs, then there should be an indigenous council developed that works with city planning. And then um, that would go through a lot of the structures of every city throughout the country, ultimately, but then definitely when it comes into the arts and it wouldn't be put all on the New England Arts Foundation to disseminate that because it would be a council made up of um, whoever is chosen from your respective communities within that region as representatives. And it would be similar. I mean, if I, I just went and voted early voting in Minnesota yesterday, if I can go and vote for my school council members and my um, justice members and whoever, then there's no reason why an indigenous council can't be put on a ballot or a vote or put into place so that this is actually actually happening and not talked about so much because it's it really is not that difficult if people want to put out land acknowledgements and all of their institution beginning programs that they don't actually put that acknowledgement within the place holding of conversations at council and um and that would actually be bringing us back to um that beginning of relation mm -hmm. where it's really been stripped and taken away from our communities is not having a voice um, and then that voice can hopefully help with the language, help with the communication, help with the development. Um, that would be an ideal, I think, um, in terms of um, our cities and our developments and our, um, and, and that, that word our, right? Um, we didn't ask for this, but this is the system we're working in and, um, and the extraction is still happening. So we are still a resource we just haven't claimed um what the position that you were talking about um so that could maybe be an opportunity if everybody wants to be so woke now that they could make that happen right it's a great okay. idea it's absolutely a great idea so so with that added it's it's like i think that, that the sky is the limit it's just a matter of creating the common language what is the common language what's the understanding base and and, and are we all working from that same place. I mean, we all individually are trying to support ourselves, our families, et cetera. And, and we have to think about that. Um, and that we have to make sure that that, that that's taken into consideration. It's, it's because that's the reality of it. But I think it's the, the whole that benefits the individual. It's not the individual that benefits the whole. And, and that, that the pooled resources, of course, creates more resource. So it's a matter of once we have that, we. I think the sky's the limit on our access. That's just my take on it. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. That's so much food for thought there. I love this idea of a common language and a kind of a consensus around these issues in how to move forward together. Um, this is such a great conversation and I, I want to continue um, talking about this in many different spaces and yet we're getting close to our time of ending and so did just want to um, open it up to Tani and Nia to see if you also would like to weigh in on this question of, of the potential of more Native artists working in in public space under this you know this banner of, of justice centering justice. Um, yeah, I would like to, I, one thing is um, somebody who is making selections, I want to be encouraging and not exclusive. And um, 
Lind, that a lot of the issue that I see is we as uh, Native artists and we as um, individuals in arts and humanities that we are only communicated to <laughs> by means of problem, problem resolution. And um, a lot of times the selection that happens or these projects that take place, it still leaves us out. And so we talked about it um, yesterday um, with, with the point of cultural appropriation in native arts and public art. But, um, you know, and even adapting, uh, what I hear is the need between the artists who presented today that we need as native people to be acknowledged within our own space. So, you know, is that us readjusting how we are stating that we want to be included and you know I, I notice a lot of us are using the word indigenous but you know we we really need to think about ourselves at this point and say this is about us as Native American people in this space and uh, you know and there's this mis misinformed and um, uh, misconstrued idea of in indigenous and indigeneity because that could be anywhere in the world anybody who has a practicing cultural belief so we as artists, you know, and I, I, I want to encourage you when you do write uh, and you come forward to us, use the word Native American, use the word United States, even though we might not have a link or identify that as our um, overarching government. Uh, you know, for me, I always say that um, the political leader that's in the White House is not my leader. My leader is my tribal chairman. My leader are my headsmen of my tribe. Um, but if we're going to look into that and we're going to have to demand our space, I want to make sure that we understand that too, that we're not just coming to the table after the fact when um, we're disappointed with the selection that some of these organizations <clears throat> and funding uh, sources are making because we are having to complain after the fact. Um, so if, if we can start that new process also, I, I would strongly um, encourage that and then um, I'll hand it off to Nia. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I really agree with what um, Bruce was just saying and thinking about pulling resources. Um, and I think that goes a little bit further um, to other than like, maybe like what, when we say resources, the first thing that comes to mind are financial resources. But I think as indigenous people, um, we have a, a lot of resources that go further than that. And um, I guess it's kind of just reminding me of the work that I do with Eastern World Intermediation. Um, but in terms of like public space and um, access and things like that, um, yeah, I think, um, I don't know, I guess uh, from living in Boston and seeing like the different public artworks or um, community engaged art, there's always a disconnect between the land, even if it is talking about the place that it's in. But um, I just feel like, um, as like a my person, my understanding of land and place, and when I'm thinking about making work in relation to that, it's not always about putting something on top of it. Um, so really thinking about how we're creating works or um, accepting works that are with the land versus on the land, um, or sort of like interrupting the land's um, natural uh, environment or um, uh like way of being um i think is what we should really be uh or what i would think would be hopeful for people that are looking at proposals or um or on councils when we're thinking about art and then also just being more open to um like art practices i think earlier elizabeth was saying about uh you mentioned something about like, what if there was just a planting of trees in a certain way? I think um, what you were talking about, like living exhibitions, I think that is like more right on the point, um, especially thinking about 
Indigenous uh, art or like just how I've sort of um, come to understand um, my creative making and my practice and um, how that's all influenced by my identity. Um, and thinking that with like public art, oftentimes it's a static thing and um, I don't think anything about the way we typically relate to the world is static. So um, I think making work that is reflective of that, it makes the most sense and that's the most, um, that's the language that makes the most sense too. So um, yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think everyone really covered it. Um, every time I wanted to jump in, someone said, something that would have came out of my mouth. So um, I was really excited to be on this panel. I'm thankful to share this space with everyone. And thank you all. Thank you, Nia. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Tani. What an honor to be here with you today to, to talk about these issues. and. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom um, and the work that you're that you're constantly engaged with and moving forward. It's very, I feel very um, heartened, and I feel stronger um, hearing your, hearing about the work you're doing. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank Kim Zito and Kamaria Carrington from the public art team at the New England Foundation for the Arts. Uh, for making this happen and for providing all of the excellent support and thoughts and, and um, initiative on this. It really means a lot. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the audience as well for joining in today. And I'm excited that this will, that these panels will be uh, recorded. Thank you, Kamaria, for that as well, um, so that people can refer back to them uh, at a later time and, and learn from all of that has been said. Uh, there's some really powerful messages here. Um, and just wanted to say, please stay tuned for the next steps too for this Centering Justice project. Um, we do, we will be continuing to do articles posted on the NIFA blog as well as a collaborative public art piece. Um, and so all of that is to come. And uh, furthermore, I would really like to keep on um, this conversation going on how how we can come together and bring bring in all of the interrelated issues of that come together through public art and to move our cultures and our and our peoples and our communities forward in a good way. So um, again, Wapita Tanka, thank you very much. Um, I believe Kim has a final final words to say. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much on behalf of NIFA. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers for your insight and knowledge. Um, that you've shared with us over the last three days. And really a special thank you to Erin and Elizabeth for helping to organize and to dream this up. Um, it's a true honor to share this virtual space with each of you. And I hope that this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation and our ongoing collective work um, towards a better future. Um, this has been really inspiring and uh, definitely look forward to continuing uh, to work with you all and, and to continue the conversation. Um, I do want to do just a small shameless plug for two of our new grant opportunities. Um, let me see if I can. Yeah, so, you know, in this pandemic moment, we dreamed up some new grants um, that we, you know, we launched recognizing and in some ways wanting to reclaim the power of art in public space to foster more just, more vibrant, more welcoming publics um, to contribute to changing the course of our collective future for the better. Um, so we launched these two new grants. The first slide is for collective imagination for spatial justice and thinking about spatial justice as the right to be, thrive, express, and connect. I think that really resonates with the conversations we've been having um, over the past couple of days and this first grant is really to support um, folks in Massachusetts to come together and to do that hard work of imagination. You, know, you don't, we don't want you to have a project idea in mind. Um, we want you 
to be thinking about public. What is public? Um, I forget who said it, but you know, we need to figure out what, com what our common language is. Um, how are we defining public and how are we defining um, who has the right to be, thrive, express, and connect in public? Um, so these are small grants of $2,000 to $5,000 for folks in Massachusetts. Um, oh, our deadline is October 19th. And um, our second grant is uh, public art for spatial justice. And these are public art grants to support projects that are focused on spatial justice, that are focusing on um, context and place. Mia, I love what you said about not on this land, but um, with this land. You know, what, what does that look like um, when we rethink uh, public art? So we'd love for folks to consider these opportunities. Um, you know, these are just small ways that uh, we've been trying to think about our work in the context of this pandemic moment and how we can shift towards more justice um, in our uh, public art work here. So those are my shameless plugs <laughs> for today. And I just wanna thank you all again um, Thank you to all of our speakers for your generosity of time and thought. And I hope that we have the opportunity to continue these conversations as well as this shared work towards collective justice. So thank you all so much for joining us and hope to be in, in real space with you soon, not just virtual. <laughs>